For me, it's a big challenge, having only you know, given time for a brief to say afterwards what really happened yesterday, what's, what we see today, and uh, facing the hill, predict what's going to be tomorrow in the other side of the hill. So I do my best to, uh, to touch some of the topics as an inspiration, so please don't expect there will be uh, the full brief about the situation is technically not possible, but please be aware, and I'll be more than happy to you to take some intellectual notes in your perceptions, and in the future, they take it as a challenges from my, my, uh, my seat. There will be a few things about role of Poland in Easter, Easter flank, or in the, the, the place in the region given to Poland historically when we're living more than a thousand years. And there will be a reflection about the yesterday, about today, and as I said, about tomorrow. Also some critical reminds about the new strategical conditions that we're exercising every day. And uh, also the biggest challenge will be just to face with the terms like a future war, next conflict, the hybrid or threshold, a new generation on whatever and however the military diction dictionary will react to the challenges we're facing today in the near and the, and the near future. And also my inspiration about directions of development and investments. So entire presentation I will dedicate to something what I call intellectual turbulence. That's what we need. That's the noob is assigned for. And also for even being a soldier one, uh, the humility, it's the most important word in my vocabulary every day and every night. So humility to the knowledge or intellectual humility will be main driver of my, of my thoughts. From history to the strategy of future, I have one slide policy, so the, there will be only one slide. It's the slide, please. Which is pretty busy, and uh, which is uh, good news, there's only one slide. But bad news is, for those that know me pretty well, I'm still able to deliver a speech for uh, three or four hours having only one slide. So uh, it's a good news and a bad news. But. Uh, what I would like really achieved is you looking in this, the timeline, is a typical soldier's approach, is a timeline, space, actors, and relations between those. So anything I say, and anything I describe, anything I'm, I'm uh, talking about will be depicted and presented in this slide. So this slide have a, three the most important parts. On the top, you see the history of Poland. Don't be afraid. I don't want to describe and talk about entire more than 200 years in the history of Poland, but with some of the critical points. In the middle, you have today, which you scale and describe as a time window from 1991 up today. And then, uh, in the right side down, you see something that I will describe as a tomorrow. So rope of Poland in the Easter flank. Listen to carefully our uh, strategical discussion in Poland and also uh, the globally. So I forget uh, uh, to mention that so many people today online uh, are, are really uh, you know, supporting our discussion and also taking part in today's presentation from, uh, from Poland, from, uh, from the Baltic states, from the Black Sea region from the western part of Europe and the United States, United Kingdom, so I'm saying hello for everybody online right now. And when I'm listening to this strategical debate, one thing is really missing. Uh, we are very reactive and focusing on the last 24 hours perception. It's probably because of the media pressure and we're losing historical context. And in Poland, is incredibly important and it matters where we are and what really happened the last 200 years, and even more important, what didn't happen. So if you see on the slide uh, very important events on the timeline, 
starting from symbolically 7072, which was a point where we uh, officially lost our independence and the Poland disappeared from a map. The couple of boxes of uh, partition of Poland and also something which was a proxy, proxy state. So uh, this line is going up to the Second Republic in 1918. It means this is the strategical gap and symbolically 1772, we lost not only independence, but we lost also strategical thinking because there was no time, no place, no conditions to think strategically about the region. The only thing but I have a, a lot of admiration and respect was just to survive. So the strongest fortress in Poland, which is uh, the Polish family, was the only one fighting for surviving religion, culture, language, and uh, identity. But there was no conditions, no space, no time, no assets, and also from uh, another players, no will to let us think strategically. So we have to keep in mind that this is time, time break matters today. We have to be faster, think much more effective, very modern, unpredictable way, but this break matters. Let's say in the left side, which is not on the slide, all of the very important places and dates and Polish, uh, Polish battles what happened, which is the Orsha battle 1514, which is a Kirchhoff Kirchhoff battle, Saul Spiels today in, in the Latvia, 15, uh, 1605. Battle of Kushin, 1610, or Battle of Susora, 1620, or Hochim, or Vienna. Everything happened before partition. And if you put the situation on a map, the places when those famous battles uh, the legendary we see on the Marshal Posuski Square in the Warsaw on the tables happened before in completely different strategical locations. And if you study carefully the locations, the answer is, is easy. Very short period of time in this time window, which is a uh, window between 1918 symbolically and 1939, is the only time and only place and only opportunity we took to think strategically. And uh, the question we don't answer is why such a great uh, strategist like Vakar, Romer, and then later on in the 50s, Miroshovsky and, and Gedroj, and never mentioned intensively in our strategical, uh, strategical debate. This is the, the question without the answer today. I, I'm, I'm, I'm taking and keeping this, this, uh, this point for you for the next, uh, next discussions. And then Second World War and the communism time in Poland. So we really see how many bad things happened for Poland. We still survive. So this is absolute extraordinary, impressive power and energy in this nation that we survived so many bad things but also very important, we have to stay and look in the mirror and answer those questions, not in a romantic way, but in a strategical one. Strategy has no emotions, just only space and power, nothing else. What didn't happen in Poland in those, uh, those uh, time window? Uh, the French revolutions and all of the implications, the relations between uh, state and the society. So we still observing the different dynamics, a kind of a strategical delay, what really happened and was introduced and experienced and implement in the Western part of Europe, not necessarily here. We had the occupation that time, we had the exploration, uh, the killing of people, the uh, uh, the annihilation of uh, culture, annihilation of uh, the, the, the human beings, and uh, no direct, uh, I would say, let's say in a controversial way, consumption of the results of the French Revolution. The same, the Congress of Vienna and Council of Europe, as well as American Civil War and American Revolution. So all of those things uh, would happen in the western part of Europe comparing to the eastern part, 
we have to be very, very careful and stand and strategically assess this situation looking to, to the point of today. So that's my, that's, my, uh, that's my description of yesterday. Without this context, historical, strategical context, understanding and building new concepts here is absolutely not effective and counterproductive. In the middle, ladies and gentlemen, we have, uh, we have a today. What does it really mean today? 1991. An Iraq war is not because every single second lieutenant which was promoted in 1991, including second lieutenant Andrzejczak, was stunning carefully Captain McMaster's 73 Easting battle and the last conventional purely armor full-scale operation in the desert of Iraq from Saudi Arabia up to the, uh, the Iraq. 1991, a lot of things happened politically, strategically, and also uh, changing the structure in Poland, just beginning of a transformation. So for this briefing, for, uh, for my description, I use it today, symbolically is of course a matter of measurement, 1991 as a symbol of, of today, confronting the, uh, the, everything we, we have on the top of the slide. So when I, when I was really going step by step in my career and the tactical levels. The first Chechnya war happened, and the second Chechnya war happened. And when I was a captain, we joined NATO. I was abroad studying, uh, studying uh, operational art, and then I realized Poland is in NATO. So it's not possible just to change the system within one day and transfer from one system to another one. So it takes a time. And, uh, and then I was surprised looking at the situation when it happened 9-11 in New York. And everybody was talking about the global terror, global war on terror, and the starting war in Afghanistan. Most of us took a part in this, in this operation uh, in the other side of the globe, somewhere in Negazny, commanding BCTs and uh, being officers in the staff uh, uh, in tactical levels, the logistics, reconnaissance, airmen. Uh, and uh, the one thing where we lost from our radar was uh, China joining WTO. It was completely, completely not visible because there was so many important things happen in a, in a global war on terror. And then we're going and see increasing performance of Russia in the region and uh, facing us to the, the war in Georgia, 2008 very important things. And everybody remembers the, uh, the uh, description of the situation delivered by President Kaczynski, what, who described what's really going on in Georgia, who's gonna be the next one. Everybody remembers. And at the same time, again, our radar, strategical radar was not calibrated properly. So Lehman Brothers and uh, changing uh, the economy, an economical crisis was not the number one for strategical thinkers. And then we see Crimea, Operation Syria, and Zapat 17 and everything. So, uh, of course, intentionally, I put some of the box, uh, some of the information in the box 2020 and 2021. And uh, it's absolutely incredible when we stop for a while, for a second, get some good espresso, and the look in the list of the things which we are victims and we are observers as well. So Navalny happens, crisis in Belarus from many perspectives, talking about the economical situation in Belarus, political turmoil, but also recently, uh, just before going here to this room, I received many reports with the situation in the Polish-Belarusian border. The, uh, the operation in Karabakh happened and was energizing discussion about capabilities on what really is the most important uh, combat systems uh, in, in, the, in the fight between uh, uh, Azerbaijan and uh, Armenia. We have a cyber revolution 
uh, including the solar wings penetrations as well as uh, uh, infiltration and, and, and trying to interdict the, the elections in many, many, many countries. And also, very important, strategical messaging from Russia in, in unclassified documents. The Russia wants us to know they're going to really use the nuclear assets for resolving political, political problems. And, um, and as well, 2021, everything here uh, you see on the slide, that's our last second in our today's or last minute message or our today's uh, uh, observation. And in the back still, we of course have a Brexit and European Union crisis in many, in many uh, levels as well as a COVID. So we still got a, got a mask and probably we will live with COVID uh, some pretty good while. And a uh, huge discussion, it will be much more philosophical one, is about the crisis of library democracy and globally, but uh, I, would, I would keep it for a second. So that's, that, that's just the yesterday, that is the today, so how about tomorrow? It doesn't sound optimistic, uh, but uh, I think we are strong enough to face analyze and uh, find uh, solutions to keep our values and standards we're living in. Strategical, new strategical uh, conditions, it will be very, very short, the shortest possible uh, version of uh, reminding what, what, how I understand the uh, new strategical conditions or we have to take into consideration what we're discussing about the new security environment. First one is uh, the prosperity and the strategical pose is over. Last 30 years, ladies and gentlemen, is my time in a uniform. 1991, it was my, I got my promotion. I was second lieutenant and having three tanks and uh, open mind for everything. And the last three decades is over. It's over. There will be no, uh, the same world so no unipolar world, no the same place and prosperity of European Union. We have a question mark and uh, completely different uh, dynamics in the, when we're observing situation in the United States of America. The US dominance and hegemony is uh, challenging every single day by many other actors, state actors and not state actors. So no matter what we think about it, no matter what kind of uh, narratives we have in our minds and our discussion, this time, last three decades, is over. And we observing the turmoil of a you know, strategical global, global order, and it's up to us to understand, it's up to us to prepare our option, our solutions to mitigate or, or in very, very military language, mitigate and win. I want to win. I really want to win. Second strategical, very important condition is Russia is back in the business. Russia is back in the table. So uh, if, you, if we look at that, that was my intention to keep this slide for an entire brief. If you going back to 1991, when I got my, my first, uh, first platoon, symbolically, um, there was no doubt, not the Soviet Union anymore. Soviet army was, was living, Poland was living, you know, uh, in many other countries and uh, republics and was a kind of uh, the, the, the former Russian republics were fighting for, for independence. It was something which is called implosion of Russia. Implosion of, of sorry, implosion of Soviet Union. So uh, there was no Soviet Union on the radar anymore, and no China yet in our strategical perception. There was a very important point of the, uh, the, the, uh, the history. And today what we see, Russia playing game. Russia is playing game in the Karabakh, in, in the Syria, Mediterranean, 
in, the Crim in the Crimea, in Donbas. Russia is playing the game in the northern, northern uh, roads. Russia is playing the game in Africa, Middle East, everywhere, in the physical space and also in the, in the cyber or in the info domain. So we have to keep in mind seriously the second factor, Russia is back, back in the business. The third point, very important, and is one of the most, uh, uh, the, the most often uh, the topics when I'm, when I'm using, talking to my American counterparts and American uh, officers, generals, and also civilian uh, thinkers, is about the American dilemma pivot to Pacific. It didn't happen yesterday. It happened during uh, the uh, Mr. President Obama time in, the, in, the, in Washington. So it means this huge strategical movement and attention to the, to the Pacific, we see every day what's going on in the, in the West Pacific, what's going on in Taiwan, not only militarily, but also in economy, uh, electronics, investments. We see what's going on in Australia with the, with the new, uh, very important uh, uh, the contracts within the American uh, nuclear submarines. We see, we see, even if we don't like and we would like to have some different things. Everything was going on in the huge, the biggest uh, movement on turning U U.S. attention to the Pacific. It's, it's reality today. With all of the implications for, for uh, the global economy and also challenging by, by COVID and many other uh, game changers and, uh, and of course the behaving of China. Uh, NATO, I'm, I'm really glad and I'm happy that so many things for today's discussion about the NATO Eastern flank and, uh, and always say, waking up, double espresso for everybody in the Brussels and in the NATO headquarters. 2% GDP matters. We're paying for security or we got a bill to pay for the enemy or threat. Disarmaments uh, and uh, and combat readiness, it's, it's very, very tough what we see. And here in Poland, when we investing heavily, more than 2% GDP, investing in our defense, defense systems in the different areas, in civilian part and also military one, we would like to have everybody in the NATO to think the same, the same, the same way. I was in a plenty of conference last uh, months and, and, and weeks, and uh, one, one word keep my attention, and I put on my nose for, for deliberate uh, stunning, which is strategic delusion. Strategic delusion, that's what I, what I put to the, very close to the number four. Next is the Easter flank. If you see the space here, Easter flank matters. Nothing happened really in this region without two important strategical hubs, Poland and Romania. So eastern flank matters. The only challenge I really have, which will be maybe not polite, maybe not correct, is our military vocabulary. We, people in the uniform, we uh, have a big challenge to, to the situation when we have the one flank Another flank, we're facing flank, and we have a flank in the back. Something wrong with our geometry. So military language doesn't understand if the only flanks. So where is the front if we have only flanks here? It sounds nice. It looks nice. It's very correct. But today, keeping in mind, last 200 years of yesterday, 30 years of today, before we find, uh, we're going to find this, you know, answers for the question for tomorrow, we have to calibrate a little bit our military vocabulary. Where is the flank? In my, my left, in my right. That was for the last 30 years of my, of my commanding troops, uh, mostly in armor, but not only. And where is the front? And uh, also I put, and I had a very, very nice discussion with German McMaster, and I really like his description of something, what he's, he says, strategic narcissism. So uh, it's uh, really, you know, bringing us to the intellectual 
humility, not be uh, strategically in the in the narcissism like uh, General McMaster describes. Uh, new conflict it will be challenge. <laughs> and observing uh, our discussion in the in the public huge debate, we have a different uh, observations. Some of the experts are they really think they know all of the all of the answers. I am four star general spending 34 years in the service in Poland and abroad, including headquarter positions, but also combat operations. And I am not so brave enough to say, and I have all of the answer, answers for uh, what the next conflict, operation, crisis will be about. So that's my presentation and dedication for humility. But in the same time, being so long in the Army, I think I have some observation and I would like to present you just for our great discussions in the future. What the next uh, the conflict will be about? Two things really. The maneuver is an integral part of our, our job, so maneuvering in the space will be uh, more or less the same. But the one factor will be completely different, which is the time compression of time, if you study carefully operational art and strategy, we never expect, we never experienced in the past such a huge compression of time factor. Not years, not months, sometimes even not minutes, it's a matter of second and everybody knows facts. Sometimes uh, uh, even we, we don't like it or we don't control this flow of info. But the compression of time factor is the main driver of our intellectual journey. So next conflict will be very maneuverable, but in absolutely extraordinary compressed environment. Talking about the time. Not military instruments of power, which is a little bit strange for, uh, for a military to, to uh, underline but that's what we see here in this, in this timeline. Today, we see importance of economy, importance of uh, diplomacy, importance and effectiveness of, uh, of uh, information, of uh, managing the info zone, and completely different than in the past. So the integration, that is a very important word, integration of uh, non-military assets and military assets is critical. So meaning of um, military instruments of power is increasing. Who gets power, who gets army, who gets aircraft uh, and the ships and, uh, and the tanks is playing the game. Not necessarily using in the first phase, but just to having for message, for messaging the other side or for leverage uh, of a situation in the region or, or globally. But synchronization and integration of a non-military assets and military assets, it's, uh, it's the future and is, from my side, the biggest, the biggest challenge. One of the reasons, and my, uh, what makes me happy, is so many civilian uh, contribution here with the, um, the ac you know, academics and, um, and science and uh, trying to, to discuss how to integrate uh, non-military assets and military assets. The last time when I was in the Black Sea Conference, the, uh, General Breedlove, he said, the rushes will be 25% of the next operation, more or less, let's say 25, It'll, you know, I don't want to fight for 20, 21 or, or 30. 25% of the instruments we're going to use in the future conflict will be military. 75% of uh, instruments will be civilian. So who is going to integrate? Who is going to synchronize? to be effective, the biggest question mark. So please not talk only about the military instruments of power without linkage and without a uh, integration with the non-military instruments. Info and cognitive superiority. Everybody here, I, I'm, I'm just predicting when everybody was, was checking the situation just before going to the room, emails, SMSs, and the last, last second informations. 
So you are influenced right now, you know, by some identities for headlines, the media, or other people, friends, looking what's going on in our, in our Facebook. And uh, who wins this domain? Who wins this battle? Who wins this cognitive warfare? Or who gets the superiority is winning entire war? Expeditionary forces, mobile, precise, selective attack systems. Nothing new, really. But what does it mean, expeditionary forces? For Poland, we changed the policy. We withdraw the troops from Afghanistan, which is still 2021, so last minute of today. This is the Nord Stream illegal immigration in Afghanistan withdrawal. So expeditionary, it means our adversaries, some of them, namely Russia. Russia is building expeditionary forces for, for projection and also for using, as a Clausewitz, and you know, uh, uh, the quote, quoting the Clausewitz, and uh, nothing, nothing new, which is using the different instruments for making policy, uh, politics, and uh, in military instruments of power is one of them. So e expeditionary. Uh, character of, uh, of the, uh, our adversaries, uh, one of the challenges. It means that we have to mitigate, we have to build the countermeasures for it to be effective. No fronts anymore. Look in the slide. Last huge conventional attack, 1991. Seventh Corps in the middle, 18 Corps in the left, huge you know, the left hook and the U.S. Marines attacking uh, in the right flank. There was a one, the last purely conventional armor charge in history. And then from uh, 1991, nothing happened. Nothing in Chechnya, nothing in Afghanistan, nothing in, in Iraq, 2003, nothing in Crimea, Syria, Karabakh, and everywhere, everywhere in the world. So uh, once we're starting carefully, we have to keep in mind there will be no fronts, very limited, in the time and space operations, even when we see the last reports, 100,000 troops closer to the, to the uh, Ukrainian border is leverage for the strategical situation. Not necessarily it means that Russia gets the capability to launch this huge uh, conventional attack to achieve goals that they can easily achieve in a completely different uh, architecture using non-military assets, weaponizing energy, weaponizing uh, illegal immigration, penetrating, uh, co corrupting uh, info zone, and so on. So it's absolutely important to, 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 to sit down and to discuss again and again. Very important, the one thing I really, really uh, did mention is uh, I'm armor and I'm cavalry. So. Uh, Preemptive attack is, my, is my, not only my character, is my nature. And I really want to have every single general officer, NCO, and soldier to be proactive and to be naturally offensive oriented. No matter what, we're never going to use and, and present in the combat our capability. But we have to train and we have to send a message that, that that's our approach to the, uh, to the uh, our challenges we're facing every day. So preemptive attacks is not only description of what we're going to do, but also what, the, what our adversary is doing is uh, main concern. Preemptive attacks mostly using non-military assets. Today the, the technology provides capability to, to attack, disrupt, destroy, suppress, influence uh, the, the other side in the, in the confrontation using non-military assets, political elements, or cyber, and so on. So preemptive attack capability and signaling strategically is the best deterrence. If you are defensive in our minds, defensive in the posture, defensive in our character, in nature, we're losing. Over horizon and non-contact warfare. Look in the slides. 
So long range artillery, that kind of capability, physical domain and also in the, in the, in the cyber. So over horizon is playing the game, not necessarily being physically in the certain places and also including, including space. Uh, also very important, uh, it's uh, the, 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 the characters we see is uh, missiles, precision munitions, drones, and robotics. Uh, and I will, I will mention a few things about the robotics and autonomous platforms uh, in the end of my, my presentation, so please keep in mind. So it means it's not about numbers, it's about superiority in all domains. It's also, again, Andre, huge challenge for us for analyzing what does it mean uh, superiority in all domains and who's going to synchronize the military domains and who's going to synchronize it with the non-military assets. But I think uh, that what we observe is limited, short, and intensive operations in a very short period of time, long and very, um, very limited assets we're using, physical assets we're using in a certain certain scenario, it matters. I was extremely inspired by the last uh, operation of the Israeli army uh, in the Gaza Strip, just right after the uh, attacks or the rocket attacks on the territory of Israel. And probably because the, the different factors, the different agenda those days, we lost, uh, we lost this operation as an example although probably that's my, that's my assessment only, the first very intensive multi-domain operation in the history. So I had a chance to talk to some of the, uh, the Israeli generals as well, and we analyzing in the uh, general staff in the top secret um, briefings and meetings, but also I would like to suggest to explore and exploit a little bit this operation, which included um, dominance in the info zone, engagement, reconnaissance and engagements in the social media. In the same time, the uh, info battle internally in Israel to the audience of the Arab states, to the audience in Western Europe or the Western world, and, uh, and also concentration of very big conventional armor units close to the operation. And then in a second, just right after uh, very effective indication and warning systems and also political and military decision-making process. In the 50 minutes, they engaged 500 targets, achieving such a huge suppression that there was no option for winning. So if you see, even in different theater, in a different space, a different historical context, different actors, this operation is extremely important for us, including numbers, numbers of tanks, and numbers of uh, APCs, and also superiority in the info, info domain and finding the cognitive warfare. A lot of inspiration, Andre. I, I believe you get some notes and for future studying. Uh, so the interesting, interesting uh, analogy when we talk into the, the historical context, Second War, and everybody remember opening second front, which was a game changer. The Red Army was moving and attacking in huge numbers from the east, and then opening the second front in Normandy was game changer, so Germany was not able to fight in a, you know, two directions. So today, uh, I'm asking myself, one front is still conventional, First Panzer Army is where it is. A highway one from Moscow through the Smolensk Gate to the Minsk to the Brest up to the 18 division locations and then Warsaw, Poznan and uh, Berlin. It's not top secret. Everybody who got a map and some very basic knowledge is able to analyze it. So conventional you know, numbers, numbers get some meaning. This is our front, I would say. And then we have a cognitive warfare, info, phase zero, threshold, new generation, Vainana Vava Pakalenia, 
or whatever we say, hybrid. So the question is, which front is the first front and which one is the second one today? So from my perspective, we have to win the first phase, first front, which is cognitive, is a perception. Once we're comparing uh, the war of energy, tanks, ships, aircrafts, missiles, and war of emotions, which is basically in the, in the info domain, who wins the first phase, who wins the first front, wins everything. Who is losing for zero is really no matter how many numbers, how many you know, hard power we, we have if we're losing the first phase. And everything is, is about the first phase or phase zero, whatever we describe. So this new you know, calibrated vocabulary, that's what I'm expecting to, to talk in the same language. That will be my victory conditions, winning the, uh, winning the first phase. So today we're observing also the geographical operation uh, in the past and moving to something that I would describe the operation in domains, not necessarily physical space only. Comparing conventional weapons to the precise ammunition smart weapons, including artificial intelligence, new technology, uh, revolution military affairs 2.0. It's, it's today, it's today. Operational projection in a very old fashioned approach, days, you know, changing, entire nation is, is changing for a wartime performance comparing to increasing maneuverability in all domains is a character of today's operations. Vertical old fashioned uh, Prussian drill common structure which is natural for, for the army. Generals, colonels, majors, you know, captains, lieutenants, command sergeant majors, uh, you know, soldiers, with a natural structure. Today, in the network, in mission command, because we're still fighting with the time, we have to accept this risk for mission command. We have to change our organizational culture to communicate not only uh, in, a, in a, uh, the vertical way, and react, but also in the, in the horizontal one, which is one of the biggest challenges I'm observing in the Army. Not only because the Army, but also with the historical context and our leadership we have, because the history here of uh, yesterday started in 1772, and today, and, uh, today started in 1901. Uh, but of course, you know, many other Calibration needed for what does it mean? Uh, you know, physical protection. We're still talking about the physical protection, force protection, or active defense, or psychological superiority, or Euro logistics. Very important to mention a bit because massive logistic concentration comparing to mobile, disperse, and and distance, and distance logistic systems. Right, and uh, how about the direction and development and investments? So in this description, you easily see we are land-oriented. I always have a huge challenge with Krzysztof is sitting here, and we have, a, believe me, hours and hours of discussion about, about the maritime domain and uh, a lot of good ideas, really. But Poland is, is uh, ground-oriented historically, and that's our place in, in the region. So everything is working for land domain. Everything is working for something. I got a big, uh, yeah, big ch uh, challenge, Krzysztof, which is we are land heavy. Heavy has a different meaning. It means uh, capable. It means effective, not necessarily it's how many tons we have. So this is not uh, land heavy in the, in the historical, uh, you know, meaning, but we need to calibrate the word heavy. What does it mean, heavy, really? And uh, in, the, in the land domain, in my radar of the analyzing, it's uh, definitely land platforms. We still need it for something, what I say, the hard power or leverage, uh, for a leverage of a situation. But the new technology and robotics. 
So huge discussion here in the, in the NUP in, in Bidgosh concerning the important po uh, points, which is uh, demography, urbanization, connectivity, that means uh, all of the infrastructure and the uh, new technologies, climate change, energy, everything about the demography. And I have huge appreciations for those that help us to translate the demography into the um, you know, political dynamics, uh, uh, sorry, for uh, uh, Polish dynamics, regional dynamics, and, um, and uh, the globally, and also the recruitment systems. So demography matters. And we see all of these scenarios. It means there will, there will be not so many poles, not so many uh, you know, good warriors for a big scale operations. From a demographical point of view, we have to start discussion about the autonomous or robotic or automatic platforms today. When I was talking to Mark Milley, he said the next 15 years uh, horizon, so he said 10 up to 15 years, 40% of the platforms gonna be you know, uh, automatic or unmanned platforms. So this is the US approach. So the question for us is the next 15 years horizon, and keeping in mind our analyzing of uh, demography is, uh, and also different meaning is much more likely even for political uh, decision makers to use autonomous and, uh, and automatic platforms for certain operation because it's not so risky. And uh, the, the machines always will be much more effective in a certain narrow you know, missions given. Uh, they, they, they are faster, much more effective. They, they don't have leave, they don't have uh, vacations and they're always ready. So our discussion, entire big strategical discussion about the yesterday, today, and tomorrow will be about the implementation of uh, automatic platforms, especially in the land domain. It's still very, very uh, challenging in my mind if one day tanks will be without a crew. But if I'm talking to the uh, airmen, they say, well, every day we have a manned platform flying effectively you know, bring in a good info, reconnaissance, and not only, F-35, the most important project also includes the entire family of unmanned platforms flying with to the operation. So the land, ground-oriented uh, land platforms, but uh, the increasing uh, meaning of, uh, and, and priority of uh, uh, robotic platforms. And also everything concerning uh, situation awareness, electronic warfare, special forces that we, we have one of the best in the world. Uh, and uh, if I may use this opportunity, last the most important operation uh, here in the slide is withdrawing troops from Afghanistan was tremendous. It's absolutely the best performance of the special forces and also airmen and everybody who was supporting uh, logistics and also uh, the operation headquarters was unbelievable. And in such a short period of time, and it's such a complicated environment, evacuation all of the personnel from Afghanistan back to Poland was incredible. So special forces are very, very high in my, in my priorities. Air domain is a deep precision strike over the horizon, long distance, and synchronizing with other elements of uh, intel, intel assets as well as air defense, but uh, challenging what we really mean talking about air defense is much more, you know, uh, very sophisticated uh, uh, the missile systems or also different approach, you know, dispersion and, uh, and the changing of platforms, uh, increasing maneuverability and uh, decreasing uh, our signature in many, many domains as well. Navy, Krzysztof, <laughs> Navy, and I think Pol Poland as a, as a Baltic Sea and in Romania here you see we have a Black Sea, very important, uh, very important regions. So for a maritime operation, the definitely maritime denial system are uh, on, my, on my top of the list. How we deny and prevent uh, operation from, uh, from a ground to the, to the sea, also including as much as possible unmanned platforms for the Polish Navy. We have a lot of new challenges. North Stream very close, crossing the, uh, the Baltic pipe. We have a lot of uh, 
uh, operation of uh, low intensity operations and, and huge traffic trade and we have to be ready and capable to control to understand the situation on the Baltic and as well react. Uh, my last study is about the LNG and, uh, and understanding of uh, Gdańsk container terminals. Again, it's Navy matters here in it new capabilities, new technologies, and, uh, but it, I'd never said the Navy had got no meaning in the battle, so just, just to be sure. And a new domain, cyber, uh, which is very effective right now, mostly talking about defensive posture, and uh, again, as a cavalry and as armor, I would change a little bit our narratives and discussion going to the offensive cyber, which is incredible, complex, difficult uh, topic. Cyber, in my opinion, has a lot of similar similarities, like nuclear weapons. It's extremely difficult if you are cyber offensive to predict consequences and real effects. But you never win a war if you're only in the defensive posture. So uh, decision-making process in the, in the cyber offense, we have a planning discussion with the, with the Americans and others, uh, and also translating to the very, still very physical land domain and, and another you know, conventional army is my, my point of uh, analyzing. But I will emphasize really clearly cyber, cyber offense is a, uh, the most important uh, direction right now for consideration. Well, uh, as I mentioned here, and the great job of Centrum Doktrin Iskolenia here in Bidgos, with our uh, studying demography, urbanization, connectivity, which means all of the infrastructure, critical infrastructure as well, new technology, energy, and the climate change and the force projection or army is just in the middle. So it, it, it leads me to the point that because demography, because we gonna f operate or fight, let's say clearly we're gonna fight in the urban environment more and more, and also new technology coming. Uh, so we need you know, higher consideration of uh, robotics and autonomous platforms for our development. Facing those challenges that I mentioned, this direction uh, will be very intensive in, in its studying. So that's my observation. Listen to the discussions here, conferences, materials you're providing, and also parallelly the same as I mentioned in the general stuff, which are much more classified because of security reason, reasons. That's the only, the only way we can really uh, design something what I call strategical asymmetry. Artificial intelligence, uh, loitering ammunition, long-range artillery, cyber offense. It's the, everything with the synchronized, you got the heavy component of the land, land uh, part of uh, ground, ground troops with this proper synchronization of uh, non-military elements of power. Right, and uh, I'm not touching much the, the uh, map here on the right side, which is a map region, flex, uh, representing the most important partners of our uh, architecture of security here, as well as, uh, as uh, adversaries here. Uh, it will be a topic for a discussion. I'm really, really happy, and I'm waiting for the results of our discussions here in the regionally. Poland, extremely important, not only in the horizontal connection between, as I mentioned, Moscow, Smolensk, Minsk, Brest, Warsaw, Poznan, again, but also in the in the vertical direction from a, from Arctic, going down through the to the Tallinn and, uh, and uh, all of the capital cities of the Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, across Poland, down to the, following the Carpathian Mountains to the, to the Black Sea, with the connection of uh, our, our source of uh, uh, sustainment of the operation, which means Germany and, uh, and entire NATO. 
So that's for our future discussion. Keeping in mind the space and, uh, and the power and the historical context, Jomini, he said, is an interior lines approach. Doesn't really matter, Does, is still valid, interior, interior lines operation. Um, if we see this map, this is our interior. So we can maneuver, we should maneuver physically and also in an info domain in this region. It's a matter of effectiveness of implementing the Jomini 2.0 interior maneuver lines. And that's the only way we can achieve you know, strategic dilemma for our adversary and to win the first phase. Thank you. <laughs>